I have no idea what was said about me because I was fussing with my computer just then. Um, so my name is Alan Donovan. I work on the, uh, the GoTools team in, uh, in New York at Google. And I'm here to talk about uh, Skylark, the Skylark configuration language. Um, it's the configuration language used by the Bazel build system. And I'm here to present a, a new Go implementation. So this is kind of the overview of my entire talk. I'm going to read it out for you. Skylark, it's a configuration language used by the Bazel build system. There's a new Go implementation. And it's available for use in your projects. I'm going to finish with a demo that explains how it can be useful to Go programmers. And I'm going to go through these bold phrases in turn, one, one by one in turn. So first, I'm going to talk a little about the general form of the language. I'm not going to go into too many technical details. Um, you can read the, the language description at your leisure. But I want to go into a couple of interesting ones that are relevant for, this, uh, for parallel uh, applications. Um, I'm going to talk a little about uh, configuration languages, what we mean by that as a category, uh, what problems they solve, and also what problems they create. And I'll give you my reasons for believing that Skylark is actually a, a way to avoid many of these problems. Then I'll talk a little about the Bazel build system and how the needs of Google's build uh, system have driven the, the, and designed the shape of this, this language. Uh, and in particular, I want to show you how Skylark facilitates imperative style programming, the usual model that, that, we're, that we're familiar with, um, but in a highly parallel program without any possibility of data races. And then I'll present very briefly the, the Go implementation um, and mention a couple of ways in which it differs from the, the Java one. And finally, I'll give you a demo of, of an actual uh, parallel Go application that uses Skylark to do something useful. So let's start with, let's start with uh, what is Skylark. So the first thing everyone wants to see uh, with a new language is, is the syntax. So I won't keep you in suspense. Here's uh, a page of typical Skylark code. It's an actual snippet of a working program. Um, and what I want you to notice here is that it looks just like Python. Skylark is a dialect of Python. It has the same basic syntax, the same basic data types, the same methods. They all work in a familiar way. So if you know Python, it should feel incredibly familiar. Um, it has functions, strings, lists, dictionaries, and all the basic primitives you need to write, write programs. Um, it has a somewhat similar module system. It doesn't have um, some of the more sophisticated features of Python, such as classes and exceptions. And I'll come back to that later. Um, the first implementation of Skylark is actually part of the Bazel build system, written in Java. Um, and obviously, the language uh, inherits a lot of uh, design from the Python community, the work of Guido van Rossum, and, and all of the, the Python community. Um, my role in the design of Skylark has just been to ask a series of annoying questions and point out bugs and try and write down all the, the, the description of the details in the, in the dark corners and try and come up with a clear description. So this, in one slide, shows you all of the, sort of the basic data types. There's 10, 10 basic data types. Um, there's a whole bunch of built-in operators. Again, if you're familiar with Python, you'll recognize all of these straight away. And there's about 50 uh, methods on these built-in uh, built data types. And so it has all the primitives you need to write interesting programs. It has functions, uh, structured data, and strings, and so on. Um, however, Skylog is not a general purpose programming language. It doesn't allow arbitrary recursion. Um, every time you write a loop in Python, you're using for loop over a finite length list or string or, or some other finite sequence. There's no go-to. Um, there's no while loops. Um, and list comprehensions, uh, this, this uh, square bracket syntax here, have the same limitations. So you can't write a loop that runs forever. Also, you can't write a function that calls itself recursively. If you try to write the uh, Fibonacci function in the recursive style here, you'll get a dynamic error. It says you're trying to call the Fib function while it's already been called. You can't do that. And so. This means you, that all Skylark programs terminate, at least in theory. Um, personally, I don't actually think Turing completeness is, is very interesting. I think what matters to most programmers is a bounds on time and space usage of their program. And you can still use all of your, your memory and time in a program that uh, is non-Turing complete. Um, so I don't think it actually is a, is a practical, um, uh, uh, important feature. Um, and it's also trivial to, to disable the recursion check, and it becomes the same language with, with recursion. However, the, the Bazel team has, has, has assured me that as a practical matter, um, the, the fact that you can't write this kind of code in Skylark has served as an important break on people trying to do crazy things and trying to be excessively clever in the build system. And this kind of warns them that they're really trying to use the system in the wrong way, and they should take a different approach. And so it's actually been valuable in, in that way. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail on this, because some, whenever you say Turing complete on a slide, it's like a shiny object, and magpies kind of grab onto it. Um, other, other differences from Python, um, it doesn't have the sort of fancier features of classes, uh, exceptions, concurrency, decorators, um, none of these things. It, it, it doesn't have the class, any class structure yet. Um, there are sort of evolving ways of doing structs. So in other words, compact uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, sort of uh, types. Um, but it's still evolving, and, and it'll maybe come in a later, a later version. Um, 
Scarlet programs, the Scarlet are designed as it was in the build system, values predictability and, and, and um, hermetic behavior and determinism. So it doesn't allow you to do arbitrary I.O. You can't read from the disk, for example. Um, you can't start threads. You can't um, generate random numbers. You can't see the clock, all these kinds of things. And this is important to ensure that a build is a completely reproducible process at a large scale. Um, the application may have some I.O. primitives and may give you a limited way of, uh, of, 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 seeing, uh, of doing I.O., but the, the Scarlet program has to go through the host application in order to, uh, to do that. Um, all the sets and dictionaries and so on, they iterate the members in the same order, unlike, for example, in Go. Um, when you initialize a Scarlet module, um, every time you see a load statement, it causes another module to be initialized, as you might expect in, in, in a language like, like Python. Um, and initialization causes all of the statements at the top level in the file to be executed in order. Uh, and those statements may de de declare some global variables. So this module B declares pi uh, a, a, a value and square as a, as a function. Um, and then at the end of initialization, uh, an important thing happens, which is that all of those values become, become frozen. They actually transition to an immutable state so that that pi becomes no longer a variable but a constant. And that function was actually already a constant, so nothing changes. Um, uh, but this, this, this transition turns out to be very important when we come to consider parallelism. And let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example now. So here we have a Scarlet module that provides a days and month function. It's, the code's a little, a little weird. You probably wouldn't write it this way in practice, but it'll do for an example. Uh, when this module is initialized, all the statements are executed, and we build up this month's uh, map in a series of mutations, a series of assignments. So this is the familiar imperative programming model where you, you change the state of things. Um, now, I guess you, in, real, in a real program, you'd use a, a literal to do the whole thing, but for now, we're going to use assignment statements. Um, and then at the end of th this, uh, this module, we declare a function which consults that, that map and, and does a lookup in that map. And so uh, during initialization, we build that data structure, and then we'll later consult it from this function. And so these, uh, these are the, the initialization statements, uh, and then later on, when we get a call into this function, we'll execute these statements here. Um, and this dictionary, by this point, has now been frozen, so it's actually an immutable dictionary. And if we were to change this program by adding a statement such as this one, which inserts a new month into the, to the calendar, um, you'd actually get a, a dynamic error. It would say you're trying to update a frozen data structure. Um, another point about initialization is that initialization of each module actually occurs in its own Skylark thread. So when module A loads module C, and maybe also module B discovers it needs module C, um, the very first one to, to, uh, to load C will um, cause a new thread to be created, which does the initialization of C, freezes that, that module, and then makes it available for both A and B to use. Um, and it, it's important here that the, the thread that does the initialization of C is not the same thread as the one that called the load statement. So it's in the case of Python and also in Java, any thread local state associated with A would actually leak into the module C and possibly change the values you get out of it. Now, you kind of, it would be crazy to write programs in, the, in that way in Python and Java, so it doesn't really show up as an actual problem. But in a build system, it's, it's quite possible, if you, had, if, you didn't, if you did things the same way, that the, the caller's thread state would leak into the, to the library and you'd actually have a, a build that wasn't deterministic anymore. Um, so, the thing about freezing that's really, uh, really important here is that it's actually a, a, a really clever solution um, to, uh, to an, old, an old problem, which is how do you present users with the familiar model of imperative programming, where, where basically your program is a, is a sequence of assignment statements? Um, how do you keep that familiar model um, and have parallelism? And a build system has a lot of parallelism, as we'll see. How do you do that without also just creating tons of data races? Um, and one of the solutions is you, you just don't give them mutation. You just have a pure functional language. But programmers don't like this. It's unfamiliar, and it requires a whole new way of understanding and thinking about your, um, your program in order, to, in order to, to do the same task. So the, the invariant that this freeze mechanism gi gives Scala-like programs is that a variable is either confined to a single thread or it's immutable. But there's no way you can have mutable state seen by multiple threads. And that means that functions can be called in a very highly parallel fashion. We can have multiple calls to that days and month uh, function in parallel, and they can't possibly affect or communicate with each other. And so I'm going to talk for, briefly about what we mean by a configuration language. Um, we can consider all these programming languages on a, on a spectrum of expressiveness. On the left hand, we have the, the least expressive, and on the right hand side, we have the most expressive. And 
this, this, the, the zero end, I suppose, is the, our data notation. So these are notations that express structured values, but without behavior, without abstraction, without loops, without conditions. It's just, think of it just a blob of JSON data, or of protocol buffers, or YAML, or any of these, these notations. Um, and it's very easy, by the way, to write tools that manipulate these things, because they're, they're just, just plain structured data. At the other end of this uh, continuum, we have uh, general purpose programming languages, tr true, true programming languages. So Go, C++, Java, Python. And in these languages, you can, you can do anything. You can write programs that don't terminate. You can express any algorithm. You can do I.O. You can create threads. Um, you can build real, real systems. Um, and of course, you can't have machines that manipulate these, these files because they're full of dense logic that humans barely understand. And then in the middle, we have this category, which I call configuration languages. So configuration languages are programs that um, express usually structured input to some other main program. And uh, they're typically short-lived. They run sort of briefly at the beginning of the execution of the main program. Um, and they also are limited in what they can do. They, maybe they can't do I.O., maybe they can't create threads. Um, and they, they might also have domain-specific features. So for example, a makefile um, is a very simple kind of programming language that really expresses build dependencies and shell commands. Uh, a Vim script uh, configuration file expresses editor key bindings and syntax coloring and, and also some actions that happen when you press certain uh, buttons in your editor. Um, so they're sort of somewhere in the middle on the spectrum. Um, also, input, the configuration input might include behavior. So in the case of um, make, it's what shell command to run. In the case of VimScript, it's what, what action to take when you do a certain trigger a certain command in your editor. So there may be, there may be functions and behavior encoded in those files. Um, and I'm sure you can think of thousands of other examples. If you just go to your home directory and look for .conf or .rc, there's a whole ton of junk in there, which is more things in this category. And so Skylark 2 sits somewhere in the middle on this, uh, on this spectrum. It's actually, a, I think, a fairly broad uh, swathe of this, this continuum. Uh, you, can, you can choose to use it just as structured data notations, and it's nice for that. Or you can actually write some fairly complicated logic. And in, in the build system, people use it for that as well. But it can't do arbitrary I.O. threads and so on. But you have a choice about how, uh, how far or how little on the spectrum you use of its, of its features. Now, Configuration languages have a, a long and a checkered history. And at Google, we've, we've invented at least 100 over the years. Um, and uh, we, you could say we've become exceedingly efficient at it. And there's a, there's a usual story is that you've built some application, and it needs a configuration file that initially just sets a few kind of path parameters and, 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 and Boolean flags and so on. Um, but then you find that suddenly it needs sort of more of this stuff, and then it suddenly needs, it needs some kind of abstraction mechanism. But you don't want to give users the full generality of, of functions because it seems unnecessary. So you add some kind of weird abstraction mechanism, and then it kind of eventually becomes too incomplete, but not in the usual way because you have loops and recursions, but through some totally weird mechanism. Um, and, and this is kind of what's motivated Philip Greenspun's observation almost 25 years ago now, when Common Lisp was kind of the appropriate uh, reference point here, and Fortran. Um, and, and so this, this is true of so many configuration languages, certainly dozens of the ones that we have at, at Google. And the most common problems that you see are weird syntax, syntax that looks sort of familiar but behaves in, in an odd way. You have broken basic data types with strings that have weird encodings, or integer arithmetic that uh, is lossy or is crammed into a floating point number, or um, weird type systems. There's a whole sort of catalog of ways in which you can do it wrong, and we've sort of explored many of them. But I think Skylark actually resist all of these, these, these criticisms here. I'm going to go through them one by one. So firstly, it draws on all of the experience and design of, of Python, which is, I think, one of the more pleasant, sort of straightforward, readable languages that has all the basic constructs of computation. And it's very widely understood. And even if you've never seen it, you can probably guess what every statement means. Um, and it's, uh, so it's, a, it's a familiar paradigm and a familiar syntax and semantics. Uh, it's also well specified. We have a language definition that specifies all the basic types, all the methods, uh, or the execution model, uh, nice and clearly. And I've provided the URL here. Um, it's not bug-ridden. We have a good test suite that covers all the major language features. Um, we've exercised this, uh, this language over the last 10 years at Google on a code base of, of, of millions of lines of Skylark. And, and we're pretty confident that, it's, um, that, that it isn't full of bugs, of, at least of the kind that you tend to find in configuration languages. Um, and, and it's not slow either. I mean, we, the single threaded performance of this Go implementation of Skylark is, is not quite as fast as CPython because the reference Python interpreter, because CPython is implemented in C and it gives you ways to, to do much more fine grained control over mem memory usage. Um, 
But as, uh, as Matthew was saying earlier, um, there's a major problem with CPython, which is you can only execute one thread of computation at once. And your machine has, I don't know how many processors now, and a server machine has, has maybe 64 processors, and you're using only one of them for your program. And so Scala, which doesn't have uh, any, any locking um, between, for, for, for a computation, is able to, to use all 64 of those cores at once. And so as machines become more and more parallel, that, that global lock in, in CPython is, is absolutely a critical uh, bottleneck. And so this, this, uh, this language, while it may not execute as fast in a single-threaded case, is maybe a factor of two less than Python. It scales way better on a parallel machine, which is every machine nowadays. So now I'm going to talk a little about how the needs of the build system have shaped, uh, shaped the language. So um, a brief introduction to, to Bazel. Uh, it's the open source version of Google's internal build system. Um, and the way it, it works is that in your directory tree, your project tree, um, every directory contains a build file. And a build file is a little specification of the set of libraries and scripts and executables and tests that you need for that part of your project. Um, and these build files, they're mostly data. I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, but these build files can also load Bazel files. And these Bazel files are mostly code. They explain how a certain language or tool is integrated into the build system. So you can, for example, load the, the file for Go code, and now you can start to build Go programs in your build system. Or you could load Haskell or PHP or, or some other language, and it just integrates and extends the capabilities of the build system. So you've got this split of declarative uh, uh, package descriptions and then uh, pure logic for the, or dense logic for the, for the extension of the capabilities of the tool. So here's two examples. On the left, we have a build file, and this declares a Go binary called myprog, um, and it has one source file, and it has three dependencies. One of those dependencies, if you follow the arrow, is a proto library. And so this is a, 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 a feature that um, generates Go type declarations from an interface description file, a proto file. And you can see that it, the, the build tool doesn't actually know how to do a proto library uh, intrinsically. You have to load this, this uh, script on the side, and this extends the capabilities uh, of the build system with a bunch of logic, which I haven't shown here, but think of it as, 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 as a, real, a real program here. Um, so if you look at the, the, these, these edges here, one of them was in the same file, that was the arrow, but the other two have a double slash at the front, and that means that they come from a different uh, build file somewhere else in the tree. And they, in turn, have their own dependencies, and so on and so on. And so you have these often very large dependency trees, hundreds of files deep in some cases at Google. Uh, and so you've got a very, very uh, large graph of work to be done by the build system. Um, by the way, at Google we have about three quarters of a million of these build files on the left. Um, and we have about uh, 30,000 Bazel files on the right. And a, a big build, the major server at Google, can, can use 10,000 of these files and, and maybe 13,000 of the, uh, the, the Bazel files. Um, externally, uh, Bazel builds aren't anywhere near that big. But Kubernetes, a substantial project, uses about 2,000 build files. Um, so you have this, this enormous graph, and this graph encodes tons of parallelism. There's tons of things that aren't related by uh, edges in the graph, and those things can be, can be done in parallel. So uh, but it hasn't rendered very well, but that blob in the top right corner is a dependency graph of hundreds of thousands of nodes, which is quite typical. And I've tried to explode up uh, one little tiny piece of it here. So for every node in this dependency graph, every library or, or tool that needs to be built, um, Bazel has to call into the Skylark logic to say, what, is, what do I need to do for this? What command do I need to run to execute this node in the build? And so this graph, which is enormous, has, has a massive opportunity for parallelism. You can sometimes do thousands of things at the same time. And so Bazel has to call into Skylark with this enormous amount of parallelism to ask it what work to do. Uh, and each of those calls happens conceptually in a separate Skylark thread. Uh, and yet, it's impossible to encode a data race, even though we're using an imperative programming language here. So it's an ext extremely scalable language for, for parallel work without data races. Um, as a brief aside, I wanted to say that this, this practical separation of code and data um, is, has been really valuable, actually, because although it's the same language underneath, um, if you structure your, your files in this mostly data kind of way, we can actually have tools that will, will transform and edit them for you. So for example, if you edit a Go program at Google and you add a new import declaration, a tool will automatically update this file so that it includes the relevant dependency line so you don't have to go and do that yourself. And it's a property this, this being mostly data that lets us, lets us do that. Uh, so finally, I'll talk about the Go implementation. Um, there's a fair, it's a fairly traditional sort of tree walking interpreter. I'm not going to go into too much detail of the, the parts here. Um, it, uh, it has a, a scanner, a parser, an AST, 
Um, and um, we have, uh, it, the whole thing is only about 10,000 lines of Go code. Um, it's, 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 it's pretty clean. You should be able to read it and make sense of it. Um, it has no external dependencies, so it's a small thing to add to your, to your system if you want to use it. Um, and it, I've written it to be pretty careful with memory. So Python is generally quite um, extravagant with memory. It allocates a lot of the time. Uh, but, but this implementation doesn't allocate any more than you need to to, to to meet the basic semantics of the language. And it runs at least twice as fast as the Java implementation, although I haven't done really thorough benchmarking, so I don't want to uh, go into too much detail on that. There's a read-eval print loop, so like Python, you can explore features of the language by interacting at a, at a prompt. Um, so I encourage you to have a, a play with the, uh, the tools that are there. The, the Go implementation is extensible, so you can link it into your, your Go application, and then you can actually uh, define Go data types that behave as Skylight values and can be manipulated by the Skylight program. Uh, can you turn the mic down? It's a little, the gain's a little high. Um, so if, you, if your Go program defines uh, methods on this, on this Go type uh, that satisfy one or more of these Skylark interfaces, um, then you can actually add capabilities to, to the Go value. So for example, if you add the, um, the uh, has binary method to your, your, your data type, you can now start to use binary operators like plus and multiplication. If you implement the iterable interface, you can use your Go value in a, in a for loop uh, or, a, or a list comprehension. Um, so you can, you, can, you can add these sort of these host application uh, uh, values into the program and manipulate them as if they're ordinary values. And I'm going to show you an example of that in just a moment. So for the remainder of the talk, I want to show you a, 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 a real demonstration of uh, a web server that uses um, a Skylark program to act as a filter for every incoming HTTP request. So the uh, server will take the request and send it to the Skylark function, which will decide whether to accept the request or reject it. And it's a very parallel, a web server is a very parallel program, and this is a, a nice demonstration. So get ready, you've got about five slides of code here. So first of all, uh, when we start the program, we need to load the configuration file. So the main thing happening here is the call to Skylark exec file. And we're loading a file called server.conf, we're creating a Skylark thread for it, and we're creating a, a globals dictionary to hold the module level values that it, that it creates. And we have to make sure that execution didn't fail, and that it produced a global value called hook, and then that value called hook is a function, and then we stick it in a global variable declared at the top there. And then we start the web server in the usual way. Can I move on? So here's the web server, the entirety of the handler. All it does is print OK. But before it does that, it calls the Skylark function, which I'll show you in the next slide, to validate the request and decide whether to proceed or, or reject it right there. And so the, the validate function will return an error or, or nil. So here's the actual validate function. Um, the main thing happening on this slide is the call to Skylark call. So this is calling the hook function, um, again in a new thread. Uh, and it's passing in one argument. And the argument is um, the HTTP request value, rec, that we've wrapped in this, other, this thing called lowercase HTTP request. Um, and that is the adapter that turns the Go value into something that you can actually manipulate from inside the Skylark program. And then the rest of the, the code is just the boilerplate you need to sort of bridge an untyped language with a typed language like, like Go. Um, so if it succeeds, it returns nil. Otherwise, it returns the string that it got from the Skylark function, which becomes the error message. So here's the data type, the HTTP request wrapper, that takes the real Go HTTP request from the web server and exposes parts of it to the Skylark program. And here we've implemented the attribute method, attra, and this is the thing that allows it to, to work with a dot operator. So you can say request.url, and you get a string, which is the URL path, or request.query, and you get a dictionary, which is a set of HTTP query parameters. And so you could add as many more of these as you want. And for all other fields that it doesn't know about, it just returns nil to say, I don't have this, this field. And then finally, here's the actual server configuration file. So this is a small Skylark program that just defines the function called hook. Uh, the first thing it does is just for debugging, it, it prints out the, um, the, the values that it got. And then it does some logic. You can make it as complicated as you want to decide whether to accept or reject the request. And now, we can go to the demo. Now this is the bit I never know if it's going to work. It did work, brilliant. Oops, so I've re revealed a punchline already. So let's start with, so you give it a request and it tells you, OK, so the server works. Um, let's try another one. Same again. And finally, give it soup. 
can't type. And it, you got an error message. And so the call took a total about it varies 50 to 100 microseconds. Um, but here we have a demonstration of uh, a parallel web server making calls to a pure function in Skylark. And now I've lost my presenter view. Um, so that's all my talk. Um, here's the URL. It just went live on Monday. Uh, please try it out. I need to point out one uh, thing here, which is that this name, Skylark, was an internal code name of the Bazel project. And now that it's been used as a standalone thing for other projects besides Bazel, we're going to have to change the name. Um, so we should probably call it Skylark Meow or something like that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, until then, just be aware that the URL will change eventually. But please try it out in the meantime. Thank you very much.